Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm very proud to be here at our community-based testing site in Peoria with U.S. Representative Sherry Bustos, Illinois General Assembly leaders Jahan Gordon Booth and Dave Kaler, Peoria County Board Chairman Andrew Rand, and of course, our terrific Illinois National Guard members who've been the force behind standing up these state-run operations, which now number 11 across Illinois. I also want to introduce the director of the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, Brigadier General Alicia Tate Nadeau, and of course, the Adjutant General of our National Guard, uh, Brigadier General Rich Neely. Because of the national shortage of testing supplies and capacity, every state over the last several months has had to limit the number of people eligible to get tested for COVID-19. But in Illinois, we went to work to overcome the problems that other states struggled with, and we made real progress. That's why just yesterday I announced that anyone can now go to one of these 11 state-run community-based testing sites and get a test at absolutely no cost. You don't need a doctor's referral. You don't need an appointment. You don't need insurance. You don't even need to have any symptoms. And here at the Civic Center, which also offers walk-up services, you don't even need a car. With businesses and parks and churches reopening, expanded accessible testing is so very important. I especially encourage anyone who's been out recently in large gatherings, like the protest marches over the last week, to take advantage of our testing capacity. Remember, we now know that even if you feel no symptoms at all and feel healthy, you can still be carrying the virus with you and spread it to others, to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers. If you think you may have been exposed to somebody with COVID-19, you should get tested. And again, it's free and available every day right here. I want to take a moment to highlight the amazing work of the Illinois National Guard here at the Civic Center, because this is just one example of how versatile and indispensable the Guard is. A dozen times now during the panic, the pandemic rather, in just a matter of days, the Guard has been doing what, frankly, nobody else could do, which is taking an empty parking lot or facility like this Fulton Street Civic Center parking lot and has set up a testing site capable of serving thousands of Illinoisans each week safely and efficiently. There are now hundreds of locations across Illinois where people can get tested, but these state-run drive-through sites alone have the capacity to support 32,000 tests per week. There are entire states that have smaller operations than that. And in Illinois, we have a total of 279 public sites for Illinoisans to access free tests, including 24 in the Peoria region alone. 108 of those 279 sites are federally qualified health centers, meaning that they can also provide institutional quality, culturally competent health care to anyone, regardless of insurance status or ability to pay. I want testing to be as easy and accessible as possible for all Illinoisans. So if you're looking to get tested and you're not sure where to go near you, you can go online to our website and enter your location and the public testing site nearest you will pop up. Visit our state website at coronavirus.illinois.gov. I wanna to provide today's COVID-19 updated data because we have some really exciting news to share. As of today, Illinois has tested over 1 million people for COVID-19. This milestone is the result of the incredible work of so many people behind the scenes in state government, in our National Guard, in our public and private hospital and healthcare systems all around the state. People who were willing to battle it out to build out a testing infrastructure that is accurate, efficient, and accessible. And we're still building, but I'm very proud to be one of the earliest states 
to hit this 1 million landmark. Out of the 18,903 tests in the last 24 hours, 1,156 came back positive. That's a single day case positivity rate of 6.1%. Since the beginning of this pandemic, we have had 125,915 known cases. And those cases have occurred across 101 of our 102 counties. The vast majority of those individuals have already recovered. As for our statewide numbers of people hospitalized with COVID-19, as of midnight last night, we have 2,911 Illinoisans in the hospital with COVID-19. To give you some perspective at the height of this crisis, that number was over 5,000. Of those 800, of those 2,911 Illinoisans in the hospital, 817 are in intensive care units and 500 are on a ventilator. I'm also saddened to share with all of you that we have lost another 59 individuals in their battle against COVID-19, bringing our total to 5,795 Illinoisans lost to this disease. May their memories be for a blessing. I know how quickly the news cycle moves with so many things happening all at once, but we can't forget the people that we've lost to this virus over the last few months. We can't forget the people still fighting for their lives in our hospitals. With everything else that's going on, this virus hasn't gone away. It is still out there. Illinoisans never, never asked to face this crisis, but there's no hiding from it. Like other crises we currently face, I have faith in the resolve and the strength of the people of this state to address and overcome these obstacles, especially as they highlight the inequities facing our most vulnerable communities, especially black and brown communities and those who've been left out and left behind. Over the last few days, I've visited communities in Chicago's west side and the city's south suburbs, and will continue to visit and learn from other neighborhoods all across this state, just as I've been doing here in Peoria today. The people and places that make Illinois the greatest state in the union are hurting from the physical and economic damages of COVID-19 and looters, yes, but we can't let that overshadow the much deeper pain that comes from decades, centuries of systemic disinvestment and structural racism. George Floyd was a human being and he deserved to breathe. Black mothers and fathers deserve to live without the fear that what happened to George Floyd could happen to their child. These are simple human truths, but they are not yet the reality across this nation. And it won't be until we actively make it so. Long-standing systems don't shift on their own, but this is necessary work as articulated so eloquently by so many of this last week's demonstrations in communities all across Illinois and across the nation. My administration is committed to building an Illinois that serves all of our residents. That work is never more important than it is right now. With that, I'd like to turn it over to someone who has truly delivered for the state of Illinois, someone that I'm proud to call a friend of Peoria and of mine, Congresswoman Sherry Bustos. I think I'm far enough away from you that I can uh, take this off now. Uh, what you see standing in front of you is what it takes to take on something like COVID-19. Um, it doesn't happen with just the governor, just the National Guard, just the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, the state, the city, the county. It takes all of us working together. And I couldn't be prouder, let me turn this uh, compliment back to Governor Pritzker for how he has led the effort in the state of Illinois. Uh, what we've done on our end, uh, since the shutdown, I have flown back out to Washington, D.C. five times. In those five times, we have passed four major, four major pieces of legislation a fifth was passed, but is awaiting action from the U.S. Senate. Let me tell you how important the HEROES Act is. That would literally bring tens of millions of dollars to Peoria County. 
and Andrew Rand will talk in a moment, but I can tell you Peoria County needs this money. When we're looking at the surrounding counties, same thing to Tazewell, to Warren, all 14 of the counties that are in my congressional district, all 102 counties in the state of Illinois would all get help. That goes down to the smallest towns. The Senate has to take that up. It's a major, major piece of legislation. To date, we have been able to bring about $40 million just to Peoria County. But that goes to things like mass transit. Um, it goes to, to uh, personal protective equipment. It is not enough. You know, we're talking about these numbers, and I remember when we passed the first bill that was about $8 billion, and that was going towards testing, it was going towards uh, research for a vaccine, and we thought that was a huge amount of money. And, um, and then we go back and we pass another bill. Then we go back and pass another uh, $2 trillion worth of a bill. The last one was $3.3 trillion. Um, so we need the Senate to take that up. We need help. We need further help here. Uh, I want to thank our men and women in uniform, our National Guard, for stepping up at this time of, uh, that we're living through in this worldwide pandemic. Um, and I also want to um, uh, talk about what we are going through as a nation. Um, as it pertains to police brutality and racism. Um, we, I really believe that this will require unblinking honesty from everybody to have a conversation about what needs to happen. We've had systemic racism for generations. We can trace this back to when this nation sh sent ships over to Ghana and brought back slaves. So this goes back hundreds of years, and we have to address this honestly in an unblinking manner. Um, I think where we are going to have the, the real answers, and, and I, I think we're seeing some positive impact right now, but white America has to have the same incensed feeling as black America about racism. And I stand ready to go back to Washington, D.C., pass meaningful legislation that will help address this. Very quickly, I know this is an aside, I've, I've signed my name off on three pieces of legislation this week that will be part of a package of legislations that will be introduced Monday publicly by the Congressional Black Caucus. Debate on those bills will start on Wednesday in Washington, D.C. through our Judiciary Committee. Um, but what I think you will see is that it's not just words, and it cannot just be words. We've got to have action, we've got to have meaningful change, and I want to be part of the solution. Governor, again, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, thanks to um, um, our, our state officials, our local officials. I'm, I'm grateful to be here in Peoria, a, a, a part of the congressional district I serve that I'm very proud of. With that, I'd like to introduce Representative Jahan Gordon Booth, who every day of her career makes a difference. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the first time that I have had the privilege of um, speaking to the media in person, uh, at least for the last two weeks. Uh, as you likely know, Senator Kaler and I have been under a mandated state quarantine uh, after our time in Springfield and working to pass a sustainable state budget in partnership with Governor Pritzker. And so this is our first time having the ability to be in front of the media, so it's good to see you all again. Um, to the men and women in uniform who are standing up this uh, testing facility uh, on the cold days, on the rainy days, on the hot days like this. Thank you so much. Uh, the work that you're doing is allowing Peoria to get back to some level of uh, what we're used to seeing as it relates to just being able to move about comfortably, um, engaging in retail and even something as simple as visiting family. So thank you for the work that you're doing. It is not, uh, it's not lost on any of us. Um, to Governor Pritzker, thank you so very much for your stalwart leadership throughout this entire crisis. Um, and as you know, ladies and gentlemen, we have been moving from crisis to crisis this year. I told a friend of mine, I said, this feels like we are in the 1918 pandemic, the 1929 depression, and the 1968 riots all at the same time. And boy, oh boy, in times like that, do you need strong, compassionate, competent, leadership and we had that in Governor Pritzker I thank you um, to my partners at the state level the local level the federal level thank you for being uh, an ally on all of this work um, but I think it's important for me to stand here and, and and bring a bit of context to 
what we are seeing as it relates to the disproportionality in COVID and how that hit black communities all across the state. And also looking at the unrest that you are seeing all over this country. And we may, there are those that may want to view them as two completely separate uh, situations, but the fact of the matter of it is, is that they are all girded by the institutional racism that has existed in this country for a very long time. And the unrest that you see in the young people that are putting their bodies on the line and peacefully protesting and saying and speaking truth to power and demanding a change, it is a result of what they have seen in their short lives and their unwillingness to accept status quo. And I want those to know that have been peacefully protesting, not just in this city, but around this country. We want you to know that we see you and we thank you for peacefully protesting for a better day and a better way forward. Again, all of these issues are interlinked. When you think about, well, why is it that African-Americans are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. It's because disproportionately African-Americans live in congregate settings. Disproportionately African-Americans are the essential workers and putting their bodies on the front line, oftentimes making minimum wage to care for others, to keep this economy going. And at the very same time, African-Americans are those that suffer most from police brutality. And the reason why they're all interlinked is because of, this, of the historic system of racism in this country. And there is no bill, there is no amount of investment and resources that will eradicate systematic racism, but what will do that is all of us collectively standing against these policies and this mindset day in and day out. Long when this moment has passed and people don't think about George Floyd and the news has moved on to another issue we still need your allyship in this fight and in this work. From the cradle to the grave, black people in this country, we endure, we survive, and we carry the legacy of this country's worst crimes in our bodies. Let me give you a couple of examples. Infant mortality, food deserts, childhood diabetes, breast cancer, maternal mortality, exposure to environmental pollutants, economic insecurity, and police brutality. We die earlier, we suffer more, and we're denied victims' compensation. From cradle to the grave, being black in America is a specific kind of injustice for many folks. We pass it down to our children, but we also pass down something else. We pass down an unparalleled resilience and an unparalleled willingness to continue to believe in and fight for a better day moving forward. And just like when I think about my mother and her fight in the movement of the 60s and this moment that we're in today, we are not in this alone. We have to continue to bring our allies into this work. We have to continue to uplift the voices that are most pained in this space and we have to continue to chart a new day and a better way forward. I have felt so many emotions as all of us have in seeing what we have seen over the last week. But what I, I have gone from being unbelievably grieved to angry to I'm now moved into a place of motivation for a better day. This for me is not about going back to normal because normal is in part what landed us here today. We're going to fight for a new day and a better way forward. And ladies and gentlemen, we will do that together. Thank you so much for being here today and for allowing me to speak with you. I'm sorry. I always do that. Um, I could not be more proud to um, have as a partner in the Illinois State Senate um, not just a Senate partner, but he's a friend, he's an ally, he's always there, and um, his history of working to eradicate injustices, not just in this community, but all over this country, goes back decades. So with no further ado, please welcome my friend, Senator Dave Kaler, to the podium.
Thank you, John. <clears throat> thank you, Governor, for uh, coming to Peoria, and uh, thank you, Jahan, for inviting him. Uh, she made uh, mention before when we had uh, a walking tour of MacArthur Avenue that this is the first governor of the state of Illinois to walk on Peoria's south side. And Governor, thank you so much for all you do. And thank you for being persistent in keeping all Illinoisans healthy. We really appreciate that. Uh, what Illinois has done has, has stood out. If you watch the, the national news, you can see that, that uh, Illinois is, is way ahead on the things that we're doing and implementing. One of these is right behind me. Uh, I just got tested here last Saturday. My wife and I came because uh, it had been seven days since uh, I'd been in the uh, legislature in Springfield. Uh, I've been tested now four times. I'm in that category of high risk, over 70 years old. So I need to make sure that when I see my grandkids and all that, that, uh, that I'm not carrying this. So this is part of the solution, is getting tested and making sure that everyone uh, in this whole central Illinois area knows that there are testing sites like this this happens to be run by the National Guard, and thank you so much to our Illinois National Guard for the hard work you do. Thank you, General. But the uh, Heartland uh, Community Health Services, uh, the Health Department, they all have testing sites as well. Um, I want to turn just a moment to, to something that uh, Jahan had said about the, the 1960s. Uh, I was a student in 1968. I remember uh, being in, in college and watching I very much followed Dr. King's visit to uh, Memphis, Tennessee to work uh, on behalf of the striking garbage workers and uh, how devastating it was to all of us and what it did to our national psychic to have uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. assassinated. I was also a uh, Bobby Kennedy supporter at that point. And so on June 6th, uh, after that uh, uh, California primary when he was assassinated, uh, again, uh, just feeling like your guts were being ripped out of the inside. Uh, this feels very much similar to 1968. We're at a crossroads, and uh, we have to now stop talking about things and start doing things. That's the one piece of hope that I have, is that I hear people say the time for, for talking is over. Now it's the time to do something. Let's rebuild our communities. Let's begin to put racial justice and equity on the forefront and make sure that as America, we finally realize that American dream. Um, I went on to work uh, six years for Cesar Chavez, the United Farm Workers Union in California and across the country. So I know what protest is about. I, I know what uh, uh, discrimination and hardship is about. Uh, from that perspective, uh, we're going through that same thing, but uh, there, there, is, uh, there is sunlight at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I see that in our young people because they have been mobilized. Uh, it's really the young people, the, the, the protest movement, that gives us a lot of hope. And there's a real difference you know, between the protesters and the folks that are concerned about where this country is going and the small f set of folks that are, are talking about the destruction and the looting. Those are not protesters. Those are looters and, and destroyers. I'm talking about the protesters. That's our hope. That's our future. And uh, thank God for that. Um, and again, we have a good team here, governor, congresswoman, uh, my partner and my friend in the legislature. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the, uh, the leadership that we have right here, and I'm going to turn it over to another leader at the local level, County Board Chairman Andrew Rand, who is a friend and who is a visionary and who is making a big difference in Peoria County. Andrew. Uh, just on one light note, for those of you who disbelieve whether or not Senator Kaler is 70, I can tell you he is. I saw a bunch of you go, no way. He can't possibly look that good, but he's also a vegan. So if, if you want to maybe get a hint on how he looks like that, and not this, perhaps, per, perhaps that's it. Obviously, I'm honored to be here with, with all of these people today. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I could say a little bit about all of them, but, I, I, you know, starting with Governor Pritzker, uh, I don't, I can't count how many times this newly elected governor to our state has been to this community to put not only his feet on the ground but his ears into work and today touring parts of our community <clears throat> that are substantially disinvested from MacArthur runs right through my neighborhood becomes university on the other side of Moss Avenue and I drive it almost every day to some function I have to attend and governor with uh, with the kind of challenges you have when when you were elected with our fiscal house being a mess and you addressing that 
and then to this epidemic and then you being the best governor in the country at managing the people's expectations of that the best I know somebody in Washington is trying to compete with how good you are um, now that we have turned to another page in our history that we keep revisiting I know you're the right governor in the right place at the right time to advance the kinds of things that we're all asking for in particular Jahan's comments today so thank you for being a real governor for the people of Illinois uh, Representative Bustos and I have known each other uh, a few more years and I was describing to her on behalf of the county of Peoria what's a 33 million dollar hole in our operating plan and on behalf of Mayor Artis over at the city a 50 four million dollar hole in his operating plan and what that means to us is a bunch of public safety layoffs permanent a bunch of police and fire layoffs permanent a bunch of bunch of roads and bridges and community redevelopment programs it, it it's a bunch of that and because of the national epidemic known as uh, I'm sorry the worldwide pandemic we call COVID-19 the disruption in our revenue sources is irreversible the, the money that leaked out of the pipe from sales tax and use tax and income tax that normally flows into the government to support the services, federal, state, and local, has been permanently disrupted. We can't get that money back. So to the extent that the HEROES Act may be the plan that helps our state and certainly our local governments here in the city of Peoria, and I can say certainly for the county of Peoria, we need that representative boost house because we're getting ready to lay off an awful lot of people permanently. I, I just want to make a remark as chairman of the board of directors of Heartland Community Health Clinic, that little hat I wear in town. Because of Jahan and the governor, we were able to start community testing several weeks before this state uh, guard facility opened. We have tested thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Uh, of color and people of disadvantaged uh, backgrounds and neighborhoods at our sites. And when the National Guard was uh, coming to town, people wonder, well, isn't that a lot of duplication? Well, you don't get to the number one million without the resources uh, available from all levels of government and from all the parties playing. So it's remarkable that we have the Guard here today and every day in our lives, the services of our Guard members being ready to protect us locally or defend our freedoms internationally, along with all service members of the United States. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for being here and being part of our community COVID testing center. Finally, I'll just wrap it up before I introduce the governor, take a couple questions and say, as a white man, I'm ashamed. As a white man, I'm ashamed. As a white man, I'm ashamed that I have to read that people in a city like Minneapolis would have to it suffer and experience the torturous savagery of George Floyd's death. And uh, I, I'm choosing the word savagery because it's, it, it's a word that I think of in the context of the white Europeans dominating the first American people centuries ago, the savagery that was employed to, to take from and never give back and to purely dominate. And it's such an embarrassment to me as a white man that we still have to live in times where it's but one more case and I'm not daring to pick on the police but I will call them out any day any time that the use of excessive force is so absurdly self-evident that there is no other way to restrain a person for passing a bad $20 bill that is ridiculous that the outcome could ever end that way no system in uh, the white power structure can possibly expect that to be a, a legitimate outcome. I grew up, and in my lifetime, 64, 68, and 72 Civil Rights Acts were passed. I lived in Miami, Florida when they rioted in 72 at the convention center on Miami Beach, and I was a student at the University of Miami when they rioted in Liberty City in 1981. And they rioted, the African-American community rioted because uh, uh, the murder of an insurance man by three white police officers in Miami Beach. And it was the most incredible wrong verdict ever. And the multi-generational poverty and disenfranchisement that brown or black youth face in our communities, I'm embarrassed and I'm ashamed for it. 
So I'm prepared to move whatever direction we can move and must start powerfully at the federal and state levels to dismantle some of the free passes uh, people get in our community for conducting their jobs. And I, and I think you guys know what I mean. So having uh, put my two cents down on that, Governor Pritzker, I forget what number you are, but you're the best ever. Welcome back to some questions. Forty-three. Happy to take any questions and yeah. yeah. It's on me. Sure. All right. Governor, good to see you again. Good to see you. And yes, sir. Uh, first question is this, Governor. Obviously, as everyone is closely you're aware of protests uh, happening around our nation and, and uh, actually pushing for the President to ask for guard to help police protect buildings and businesses from looting and vandalism. Mm -hmm. But many of the protesters would like to see a similar stimulus package from the governor. Well, we need to do both. Um, the fact is that we've got to, we, there are a lot of reforms that need to be put in place. As you've seen, I've acted on some of those reforms even before this moment. Criminal justice reform as one example that I have acted upon. I was just talking to uh, Representative Gordon Booth about our plans for criminal justice reform in the coming session. Actually, it was planned for this last session, but as you know, there was a truncated session, so a great deal didn't get done that all of us would have liked to have done. But there are uh, a number of fronts on which we need to act. I talked about criminal justice reform, but uh, police accountability, there's no doubt about it that this is something that should be acted upon at the national level, at the state level, and at the local level. So there's a lot that needs to be done there, and we're talking about, uh, I'm talking with members of the Black Caucus in particular about what we will do at the state level. And then I wanna make a, a special uh, emphasis on the investment that needs to be made because these we're talking about things that need to be addressed uh, in the immediate future regarding the the violence the killing of George Floyd and so many others by the way sometimes there isn't a camera there and it happens and uh, we saw Ahmaud Ar Arbery and and so many others uh, Brianna Taylor and so on. Um, but it's the sustained disinvestment that's occurred over decades and, and the lack of investment for centuries. And now the need for sustained investment that we need to focus on. And it is, you know, I know people don't think of a budget as being an answer to justice, but actually a state budget I say this all the time, it is a reflection of our values, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a moral document. What we do in a state budget, what we do with the dollars that are available to us at the government level is very important. And you see, if you just look at where the dollars have been invested historically, it's not been in the disadvantaged communities, the black and brown communities and communities have been left out and left behind. So I, I'm committed and dedicated to doing the kind of investment over a sustained period of time that is required. By the way, a lot was done in this last budget, even though we didn't have a lot of uh, our own resources to put to it. Um, and we hope that the federal government will step up for, for our county government, for our, our city governments um, uh, to help us out. But, but we all made a commitment to rebuilding communities across the state in this last budget, even before these protests came about. There's more that needs to be done. Yeah, well, what I've said is that uh, if the leaders of the General Assembly call for a special session, I'm right there. I think we should do it. I, what I, one thing I do think is we need to make sure we have an agenda to put forward. Uh, there, a lot of work needs to be done to develop that agenda. I can tell you what I think I just did, but it needs to be put into effect in more than what I just said. And so there needs to be work to put an agenda before we together before we call for a special session or any session. I 
I this uh, uh, prospect was just brought to me, you know, over the last few days as one of the things that we ought to be thinking about. And I honestly, I had not thought about a special prosecutor. I had not seen the bill before. That's the honest truth. Um, I think there's a lot to it. I think that making sure that there is a truly independent investigation of the circumstances surrounding a killing, surrounding a death, um, is something that's very important. Just saying that police will investigate themselves or, or letting the leadership even of a city investigate the police, that by itself isn't enough. Well, I think that, let me compliment the National Guard one more time, but, but let me also bring up the name of the Illinois State Police, because they've been working in very close uh, collaboration across the last week to bring down the temperature across the state to support local police departments. And you've seen, I think, over night after night, I mean, I've watched it up close and personal, uh, you know, that the, that the looting has come down, the violence has come down. Um, last night was the best night uh, over the last seven, um, and so uh, I want to compliment the work that's already been done. We've called out more than a thousand uh, between the National Guard and state police to work together across the state. And remember, we're not just sending them places. We're, the local communities are asking us for help, and we're responding by uh, posting National Guard and state police in those locations. And where we've been called to, where they've been called to, they've done an amazing job backing up local police departments. So I, I won't call on our uh, Brigadier General, uh, our Adjutant General, to, to answer, although he will give you a long and sustained uh, response. But I, I guess I'll, I'll say, in short, we go where we are asked, um, and there is a discussion that takes place between National Guard with state police involved um, and the local uh, officials, both elected officials and the law enforcement, very importantly. So that's all done as partnership. So we don't go where we're not asked to go, um, and and we'll and the National Guard, and this is important, does not have frontline duties, um, you know, uh, to to respond as a the first responder when something's happening. National Guard is a very strong force, and they're not designed to be a police force. We have military police in the National Guard, and they're amazing. But they're not designed to be frontline police officers like many of the law enforcement that are here. Uh, instead, they are support mechanisms. So, for example, uh, making sure that, a, that people who are, you know, off ramps, on ramps are guarded, that uh, areas that you don't want protesters moving into, that there's a, uh, you know, a, a line of National Guard and vehicles and so on that are making sure that the protest movement is moving in the right direction, that they're marching and not, you know, harming a community. Um, but they have stood uh, as support and been asked to stand as support for local law enforcement, and that's the best place for them. And they've done, one more time, an amazing job. If you ask all the local law enforcement, they will tell you that. Well, I can't say it enough that um, there's no doubt, and I don't want to put Congresswoman Bustos on the, on the spot because she voted for it already. Um, but the federal government has to step in. This isn't just happening in Illinois. This is happening in every state in the United States, even the ones you think of as have never having any budget problems. You know, when I first became governor, I remember sitting down with the governor of California, the new governor of California, and uh, he said, what's your biggest problem? I said, well, we got to balance our budget in the state. Uh, and I said, how's your budget? He said, well, we have a $23 billion surplus. Okay, so I said, well, well, I won't tell you the rest of that conversation, but, but I will tell you this, they have a $54 billion deficit now. So that just tells you one state, uh, but that's, you know, that's happening all over the United States. So local, county, and state governments need help from the federal government, just like all the big businesses, big industry, 
uh, the airlines and all the rest of them got help. We need help and we're on the front lines of lifting people up when they've lost their jobs and they need medical care, you know, and they need to take care of their families and they need uh, child care and so on. I wouldn't say I anticipate delays or setbacks, but I'm concerned, worried, uh, that seeing so many people packed so close together in the marches that I've seen, and again, I, I support the you know expression of their First Amendment rights, um, but so many people were so close together. I'm glad to say so many were wearing masks. That, that, that's half the battle, for sure. But uh, I worry, and you won't see it show up. It doesn't show up in the case numbers early you know where it shows up where you really will see it is two to three weeks hence so two to three weeks from beginning at the beginning of this week look at the hospitalization numbers that's where you'll start to see either movement or not and then we can either develop some confidence about the outcome for phase three or some concern Well, that would be fantastic. I mean, let's all celebrate. Um, I said that, you know, when we built out McCormick Place as an alternate health facility uh, and people were said, oh my gosh, how many people are gonna get COVID-19? I said, look, if nobody gets it, nobody moves in there, you know, what a great day that'll be. And that's exactly what turned out to be uh, because so many people followed the rules along the way. Uh, as to, you know, uh, if, no, if people end up two to three weeks from now not having uh, COVID-19, fantastic uh, wonderful and by the way about three weeks from now is the beginning of phase four all four regions uh, being currently on track to go to phase four but again there's that's why we have this period to watch the hospitalization numbers and all the rest well, would you consider changing anything to your large gathering uh, rules in the next few phases if that doesn't happen? I look you don't want a politician making decisions about uh, like that what you want is is uh, your elected official your leader uh, listening to the scientists, to the epidemiologists, which is what I do, and then, you know, asking questions, poking and prodding, and making sure they've got it right, and then a decision gets made. And I'll take responsibility for the decision, but I'll also say I'm not doing it by myself. I'm doing it in collaboration with experts. All right, not too many more questions, because I know it's hot out here. <laughs> So our public health officials are talking to casino owners uh, and other experts to, to try to figure out how you could do it. I mean, I know other places have open casinos. We've heard a lot about this out of Las Vegas, of course. But look, the goal here is to get everybody back to work, but to do it safely. And so when you think about, I don't know about all of you, but when you think about um, you know a slot machine or a blackjack table with six or however many people around it in very close quarters uh, with somebody facing you, you're all kind of facing each other. I mean, those are challenges. I'm not gonna make an epidemiological uh, decision about that. I, I, I don't fully understand why six feet versus three. Um, I know masks are hugely important, but the point I'm making is that whatever we do with regard to casinos and with video terminals um, it has got to be done with the thought in mind that the states and the cities that keep their people safest, this is the history of pandemics. The states and the cities that keep their people safest are the ones that do the best economically coming out of it. So we're doing our best to, to open our economy, but do it in a way that keeps everybody safe and healthy.
Well, uh, you know, look, when, when the, again, when the scientists are, are giving us information that's helpful for us toward moving and uh, toward opening, um, I'm listening. And so the signals they gave us were that we could move this direction. And of course, it helps us move toward opening schools in the fall, which I'm determined to do, I want to do, uh, and, and, you know, I expect that we will be able to do. Um, but I just want to be clear that, that, again, these are not arbitrary political decisions that are getting made. Uh, they're decisions that are getting made based upon the development of the research and the science about keeping people safe. <laughs> well, Dave's reading the Chicago Tribune, I guess, um, and uh, all I can say is uh, I know there are a number of people who aren't wearing masks uh, in Scott County because they say uh, they haven't had any cases uh, and there hasn't been a recorded case in Scott County. It's the only one out of 102 counties, the only county that doesn't have a case, and that's fantastic. I would say to everybody, this pandemic, this virus has no boundaries. And so I'd be extremely careful because people in Scott County don't just stay in Scott County. They travel, they engage with people, and they may become sick as a result of that. But I just want people to be safe, and I hope people do enjoy themselves. But wear a mask, wash your hands, be careful. Well, yeah, first of all, the budget that, that was just passed, you know, there's a lot of federal dollars that are in that budget for COVID relief. Um, and so there, there are a lot of dollars still yet to come. We announced today grants to small businesses, but I want to reiterate, you know, that uh, so far we've uh, sent about $30 million to small businesses across the state to support them and their reopening and their surviving and making sure that their employees get paid and so on. Um, we're trying to help people through this period. There's more money to come that came from this budget. The one program that we announced today, uh, we put about $1.4 million out, out of about $20 million just in that one loan program, but there's much more to come. All right, last question for you. Uh, Greg Bishop from uh, T-Square. What would you do differently to prepare for the economic consequences of the pandemic and your response? That's such a hard question to answer, and, and the reason is, if you don't know all the facts about the virus, you know, how it affects people, uh, how it transmits, uh, how fast it would move, uh, you don't know. And that's, so that's what was happening. You know, every day of this crisis, we've been reacting to new information, things that we've learned, what the CDC tells us as they learn things, as we watched other countries, Italy, China, Spain, France, and so on. Um, so it's hard to second guess uh, you know, when you're in a dynamic environment, I think all of you remember that it was a very quick pr progression of decisions that needed to be made, uh, you know, uh, limiting gatherings. You remember, you know, I remember having a meeting in my office about closing down St. Patrick's Day. I mean, that's not something you do lightly anywhere in this state. Uh, you know, that's a lot of business for small businesses. That's a lot of people enjoying themselves. Nobody wanted to do that. but but it became clear that that was something we needed to do. What about just even before that, closing down visitors at nursing homes? I mean, these are very difficult decisions. I don't know how to second guess what we did. It may be easy to be a Monday morning quarterback and look back and say, well, gee, if I had known this, I would have done that. So we're, uh, I mean, the answer is, you know, we're making the best decisions we can with the science and the data. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm sure that, that people will six months or a year or two years from now look back and say we should have done x y or z but if they weren't in the room with the information at that moment then i don't think they have a leg to stand on all right something for reporters thanks everyone well, i can never Last say question. a lot that a reporter lied. lied sorry but i know i did but i uh, promise you this one from going. long time anchor gary moore and Peoria. he just wants to know how was lunch in rough weather yeah go ahead everybody it was we, we, we got to eat, we got to grab a little uh, food to go, and I hate to admit I really enjoyed it. So. <laughs> Best wings in the country. It is really terrific, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was a great last question. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.